Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me clearly? I've practiced. Yesterday, nobody could hear me. Welcome to the second lecture in the course on the brain and behavior aspects of addiction. To this morning, we have Dr. Mike West, who is a, who is serving under a joint appointment with the University of Cape Town in the Department of um, Psychiatry and Mental Health, where he's attached to the Addictions Division, and the Provincial Government of the Western Cape. He conducts his clinical duties in the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health out of Grootskia Hospital, where he co-manages the acute psychiatric inpatient service. He also consults in private practice at a Kiso clinic in Milneton. Since completing his postgraduate degree in psychiatry in 2013, Dr. West also completed a year-long fellowship in psychopharmacology under Professor Dan Stein. He will, I'm sure, explain what that is, but we probably all have a sense it's got to do with drugs and mental illness, <laughs> the drugs that is supposed to help in mental illness. Anyway, so he completed a fellowship in psychopharmacology under Professor Dan Stein, who is also the head of the department, okay? And as he's recently published a series of treatment guidelines for the management of common psychiatric conditions. He is highly knowledgeable in the assessment, diagnosis, and management of substance use disorders. And interestingly, he says, he is a proponent of harm reduction and evidence-based practices. And I hope you will talk more about that in your lecture because I looked it up and discovered there is a whole international network of people involved in against um, who's, who's in involving the whole problem of drug abuse, who believes in this concept of harm reduction and evidence-based practices. I know a little bit about it, having read, but I think you should talk more about it. He says he's also an outspoken critic of the war on drugs, and he describes himself as an eternal student. So he just recently completed his M4, his, master, his master's in addictions mental health which is a new course which the department has started, about, uh, I think about how many years ago? About two, it's only about two, three years old. And I don't think there's any, anywhere else in the country where you can do a master's in this addiction counseling. For people interested in, you may have your PhD or whatever qualification, whatever other aspect of medicine or psychology, but people come and register for this because it specializes in the treatment of addictions. So it's a very exciting new course that the department has started. And what he's doing also, he is investigating, he's also, we were just chatting about it now, he also is also working on investigating different clinical approaches to help patients with schizophrenia to stop smoking. Welcome. Good, good, good. Okay, uh, hi, morning, morning everyone. Uh, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, just like Sam yesterday, if I'm going too fast or if I start mumbling, please just let me know, okay? Thank you very much for the introduction. It makes me sound a lot more uh, Im important than what I actually am, but that's, I guess, the point of a good introduction. So uh, thank you very much for everyone attending today. Um, yesterday was a really, really interesting lecture. Um, today we're going to be a little bit less technical, a little bit more clinically orientated. I am a clinician at heart. I am a doctor by training, so that's where my sort of field of interest and where my expertise lie. So what we'll do, we'll speak a little bit this morning about the social epidemiology of substance use. So really these sort of social constructs um, that lead to substance use. Uh, oh, goodness. Good idea. Let's do that. There we go. Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about the social epidemiology of substance use a little bit, and I'm going to sort of orientate you guys to, to, to I think, some quite interesting um, data on substance use disorders, which I don't think many people know. Um, we'll have a look at particular substance use disorders in clinical practice. How do we do an assessment? What are the goals of the intervention? And we'll have a look, a little closer look, at some of the sort of bigger classes of drugs that are more commonly used in the Western Cape. So we'll have a look at stimulants. We'll have a look at central nervous system depressants. And cannabis is its own drug. It's in its own category. It doesn't really fit neatly in 
to anywhere. It's a very, very uh, hot topic at the moment. So I think uh, hopefully there'll be some time at the end and we can have a little bit of a chat about cannabis and, and have a look at the evidence for that. So in order to, let's, let's, let's contextualize before we start. So, you know, this historical use of substances goes back to about 13,000 years before the present time. Um, there have been reports of, of, of um, people in Timor and Thailand eating betel nut, which is a sort of stimulant containing uh, a sort of a plant product. Um, it's also quite closely linked to um, mouth cancer and oral cancer and what have you and all of that. Before European contact in Australia um, and in North America, the sort of native peoples there were growing tobacco quite frequently. That goes to back to about 7,000 years ago when the people in South America were also growing cocoa uh, for its naturally occurring alkaloid cocaine. We've got a sort of her earliest recorded use of opiates, so uh, morphine and opium, going back to about 2,000 years um, before today. And it comes out of Mesopotamia, I think. We've got about, got about a 3,000 year history of psychedelic use um, with mescaline and the peyote cactus and psilocybin and magic mushrooms. Um, and we've got about a three to 4,000 year history of, cannab of cannabis use as well, going back to China. So the point is, is that most people today in the world, believe it or not, use at least one psychoactive substance. And that could be something like caffeine, it could be, um, it could be tobacco, it could be other illicit substances like prescription medication, or it could be illicit substances like most of what we're going to talk about today. So by psychoactive, what we mean really is that it affects the mind. So there's another word that I'm probably also going to throw around, which is narcotic. And narcotic essentially just means it gets you high. It, it gives some sort of positive reinforcing effect. So most people use at least one psychoactive substance in the world, and this is quite controversial, but most people do so without any problems whatsoever. And I've got a graph to show you that a little bit later, and it, 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 it will, I think, help to put things into perspective a little bit. But let's not forget, okay, that substance use disorders are associated with significant and serious physical disease, and obviously in my field of expertise, mental illness, Sometimes this idea of temporality, you know, what came first, the addiction or the mental illness or vice versa, it's very much a chicken or the egg scenario. And they're very, very intimately related in terms of cause and effect. There's obviously a lot of disability, both personal disability, loss of workplace disability, loss of income, loss of productivity, and death, of course. Um, in, 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 in some instances, a substance use disorder can be so severe that it will result in the death of a person, either from intoxication, from overdose, and in sometimes in the cases of alcohol and prescription medication during the withdrawal period, which is actually the most dangerous time for those drugs. So the next slide is a, is, is, is a really interesting slide. I'm not sure if you can really uh, see the stuff very much, but basically this is a analysis that was published in about 2010 <laughs> in the International Journal of Psychopharmacology by Professor David Nutt, um, who's based in the UK. He's a very, very outspoken um, scientist, researcher, and psychiatrist. And he was the drug czar for the UK until maybe about four or five years ago when together him and his team of researchers published a paper comparing the use of MDMA or ecstasy with riding a horse. And what he managed to find and demonstrate very elegantly in the study, in fact, was that MDMA was about 30 to 40 times more safe than riding a horse. You're more likely to have a serious fatal incident playing polo or riding a horse than you are taking ecstasy, which is very, very interesting. But he came out and said that, and then he got fired. because. Uh, <laughs> But he's still very, very active in the research community. He does really, really great lectures, and he's very, very involved now, actually, in, in, in looking at um, the potential use of psilocybin or magic mushrooms in the treating of depression and anxiety. But back to this slide, basically what he did, him and his team of researchers, what they did and what they plotted on the graph was they took all the substances of abuse, the most common substances of abuse, and they plotted them along this graph. So what we've got here on the x-axis is basically a sort of quantifiable score of harm to users. And on the vertical axis, on the y-axis, we've got a score for harm to others. And then drugs were plotted based on their risk of harm to self and harm to others. And what we can see here is that quite clearly, crack cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine are very, very, very damaging and harmful to the user. What we see up here is very interesting, is alcohol. It seems to sort of be in the, a little bit in the middle. Um, but you see that these sort of harms to others are significant. And this is because of things like road traffic accidents, domestic violence, and so on and so on and so on. And then here we've got our, our friend tobacco, cocaine, amphetamines, which sort of fall somewhere in the middle. And what's quite interesting is actually there's a lot of clustering on this graph. And a lot of sort of drugs are clustered around 
the sort of bottom left corner of the graph, sort of with the implications being that the harm to users and the harm to others may be less than what we've been led to believe or what we've been told. And this is important um, sort of implications for research. Because if we want to do research on a particular drug, we need to demonstrate that there's no harms or that the harm to the or that the potential risk of harm to participants in the trial is minimal. So this is actually really, really good so that we can demonstrate this. And actually out of this, there's been a lot of trials looking at ketamine, which is a an anesthetic drug. It's also used as a horse tranquilizer. It's very, very effective medication for the outpatient management of fractures, of children with burns, for example. It seems to have a rapid, rapid antidepressant action, literally within an hour after a receiving a dose that is maintained for up to 72 hours. So this is unheard of in our sort of pharmacological literature. When we give patients antidepressants, we say, well, you're gonna, you need to wait a couple of weeks before these things start working. But here we've actually got a drug that's unfortunately a controlled substance that might be actually the sort of wonder drug for the treatment of depression. That's why it's important to have, to have an idea of this. And I think what's important to emphasize is that alcohol, tobacco, and benzodiazepines um, are, in my opinion, sort of three of the biggest killers when it comes to substances, and these are actually legal substances. Sorry, could you just point out where alcohol is? Oh, it's right up there at the top. Oh, 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 right up there at the top, yeah. A very, very damaging, damaging toxic substance. So the war on drugs, right? So, so Richard Nixon, you know, the first president sort of to, to, to ever resign from office in the United States. Um, in June 1971, he launched this war on drugs, you know, this sort of highly militarized, we're going to destroy drugs by force, we're going to attack the traffickers, we're going to attack the producers, and we're going to attack the users as well because they're morally repugnant and reprehensible and need to be punished. So it was a very, very punitive approach to substance use disorders. Um, and in fact, it was sort of launched in the 1971, there was this this um, UN Convention on Psychotropic Substances, which essentially sort of set out how we classify drugs, so class one, class two, class three, and class four. And if you sort of go and look at that document, what you'll find is that it's actually really, really arbitrary. So they classify drugs depending on risk of harm to self, risk of harm to others, and potential therapeutic value. But when you look at some of the drugs, like for example, class one are drugs that have got no therapeutic value, they're very, very damaging to the self and very, very damaging to others. We're actually seeing drugs there like psilocybin, MDMA, to a lesser extent cannabis um, that may or may not have some sort of therapeutic value. And then in Schedule 2, which is actually supposed to be less severe, we've got very, very harmful, damaging drugs like methamphetamine. So uh, the classification, like I said, is very, very arbitrary. And unfortunately, South Africa signed this convention, as did most countries in the world. So we're kind of actually using 40 or 50 year old legislation at the moment in South Africa to decide on what drugs should and shouldn't be legal and how we manage drugs that are and aren't legal. So the sort of unintended consequences, I guess, of this war on drugs, you know, and I'll sort of just read it here in case people can't see, but prohibition laws cultivate a drug culture of an amplified danger and risk, and this is really, really true. And the tragedies of drug abuse, which are very real, I've seen them, they're real, they exist, but these tragedies are used as evidence for tougher laws. Because people are dying, we need to be stronger. Because people are overdosing, we need to confiscate more drugs. And unfortunately, what happens is we don't, we neglect how much harm is actually caused by these laws themselves. And this war on drugs very, very quickly evolved into a war on drug users. And I think that's where we are today. And if we look at rates of illicit drug use, or you know, hashtag fail probably for the war on drugs, what we can see over this 10 year period from 98 to 2008 was a percentage increase of about 30% for serious drugs like opiates and cocaine, and a sort of continuous sort of rise in cannabis. And this is sort of happening at the moment. So there's a sort of slight steady rise in substance use. Whether that's because we've got more people on the planet now or not, it's really hard to say. But the point is, is if this war was successful, these numbers would be a lot lower. And you can't even really call it a war, in my opinion, because wars end. Um, and this war hasn't ended. So going back to what I said earlier, if we sort of look at rates of illicit drug use internationally, so this is data from 2015 from the UN Office of Drug Control. So what you can see on these graphs is basically there's, there's, there's yellows and blues, all right? So the yellow is the number of illicit drug users in the world, okay? So it's estimated that in 2013, there were just over 250 million people in the world who used illicit substances. This doesn't include alcohol, prescription drugs, or, or tobacco. So it's quite a staggering number. But what's quite sobering, and I think what's quite reassuring, is if you look at the blue on the graph, 
And these are the actual number of people that are classified as problem drug users. So these are people with substance use disorders, people with disability, people with interpersonal challenges, and people that are highly at risk for the negative effects of substances. And what you can see is it's actually only about 25 million. So 90% of people who use drugs and alcohol do so without problems. And this is what I said earlier. But that doesn't mean we must neglect this 10% or these 25 million people in the world, but it means that maybe we should have a look at how we're spending our money so that we can actually do more for these people that are, that are having problems instead of consigning them to a sort of life of criminal records and so on. So when we look at some of the consequences to the war on drugs, there's a lot of human rights violations. So in countries like Thailand and Indonesia, you, everyone knows you can be sentenced to death for trafficking drugs, okay? But what most people don't know, actually, is that most of those trials are actually extrajudicial. They take place outside of an official court. Often it's a military court. You don't have any representation. You might have been mistakenly accused, but the process is not even held in. There's no interpreters available for, for defendants, for example. So. A lot of times, people are, in a way, and I could say maybe in the early 2000s, there was essentially a massacre in, in, in Thailand where over 2,000 extrajudicial killings were completed in about a week. And interestingly enough, over 50% of those were actually users. And when you look at sort of other human rights violations, it's, it's, it's innumerable. Um, we've got this idea of over-incarceration and prisons for profit. So in the United States, 50% of federal inmates in prisons are there on drug-related charges. Okay. And you've got this really perverse system in America with privatized prisons. So it's prison for profit. So the bigger your prison, the more people in it, the bigger your purse at the end of the day. So what greater incentive is it to put people into prison than getting income out of it? Okay, so it's really, really perverse. And interestingly, when you look at those, those federal inmates, those inmates in those federal penitentiaries, it's more often than not, 90% of the case, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people that were impoverished, people that had no other reasonable, realistic alternatives to getting out of the situation that they were in, and they were essentially a compromised people that have been further compromised by this war on drugs. Certainly the stigma, this idea of criminal records, restrictions on travel, employment, if you ever go into America, don't tick yes on the box that says I've used an illicit drug because they won't give you a visa. It happened to one of the people from our department. They blocked him. He was going to speak at an international conference on drug abuse. And they asked him if he would used drugs. He said yes. And then they said you can't come in. But that makes no sense because what about all the other people that were talking at the conference? You know, did they all lie and tick no? Probably yes. So, and then for, sort of from a, from a local perspective, you know, there's this, there's, often you hear people saying, oh, this person was caught with drugs, or this person was dealing drugs, and, and, and the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, put that person into prison and take them away from society. But actually what we don't realize is that this is our youth. So you've got a 17-year-old child or an 18-year-old child from a very, very poor area who is selling drugs because there's nothing else to do. He's got no education, he's got no income, he's alone. Now, instead of taking that child and saying, let us help you, let us create alternatives for you. Let's create a reasonable, realistic opportunities for you. We now want to take that person, put him in prison, give a criminal record, and we all know with a criminal record you can't do anything. So any opportunities that that person may have had are taken away. So I really, really don't agree with this idea of prosecuting, criminalizing drug users, and even to a lesser extent, um, low-level traffickers as well, because quite often those are just users who are doing something in order to finance their habit. And then most certainly when we look at the economic consequences of the war on drugs, it's staggering. You know, the, 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 the US government spends about $500 per second um, on this war on drugs. It's a staggering figure. Um, I think they spent about, in 2010, it was like $15 billion. So at the current exchange rate, that's like 30 billion rand. It's huge. Our GDP in South Africa is 330 billion rand per annum, or maybe 350. So 10% of our GDP is being spent by the Americans on this war on drugs, and it's not doing anything. And then obviously environmental, there's ideas of sort of deforestation, spraying of crops with organophosphates, DDT. It happens regularly in the Eastern Cape. Hmm? Would, you, would you advocate uh, opening up Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think we can maybe talk about it that, that at the end because I've got a slide on that, but just very quickly, I think um, there is a role for regulation of substances and to regulate something is not to say it's legal, like alcohol is regulated, tobacco is regulated, it doesn't mean that everyone can just go and buy alcohol wherever they want, whenever they want. So for example, um, if one looks at cannabis, you know, one of the arguments against decriminalizing cannabis is that 
um, it will become more accessible to the youth. But actually, the converse is true. Because it's an unregulated industry at the moment, it's a lot easier for a child or an adolescent to get cannabis, drugs, or anything else that they want than it is for them to get alcohol, because alcohol is very strongly regulated. So I think with a strong legislation, and I think a strong enforcement of that legislation, we can look to other countries who've modeled this very, very successfully, for example, Portugal. So in Portugal, in the year 2000, every drug was decriminalized, every single drug. Um, and that's happened, and, and it's still occurring to this day. And there was a lot of doom and gloom and naysayers when it happened, but actually it's been one of the sort of more richer um, success stories, actually, from re-looking at drug policy. But we can maybe chat about that more at the end. And then obviously we've got this sort of militarized black market as well. So, so, in, the, so, so you know, in the 70s and the 80s, the United States were worried about communism. They were funding sort of contras and um, sort of rebels to over top it, to, to topple over communist regimes. And essentially what happened was they sent a lot of money and they sent a lot of weapons to these people. And then when these people came into power and they took control, they had the weapons, they had the money, and they had the power. And they realized that, wow, we're sitting on a massive cash crop here of cocaine, of opium, methamphetamine, whatever. And then these people turned into the traffickers that we, that, that, that we see today, that we read about today, Guzman and Sinner lower and all of that stuff. And to the point where there's so much violence in Mexico at the moment, I think there's been something like 30,000 um, sort of drug-related homicides over the last four or five years. And these are um, lay people that are getting murdered, it's innocent people that are getting murdered, it's journalists that are getting murdered. I read about a mayor in Mexico getting executed basically on the day of his inauguration. So it's in a way these cartels own Central America and South America, and it's because we've created this black market economy. Um, we've created the space in, or, in which they can operate and oper can operate quite freely because money makes the world go round. And if you're a big cartel, you've got a lot of money to make things go where you want them to go, to pay off the people that you need to pay off, and to make sure that your product gets to where it needs to be at the end of the day. And then just a sort of maybe this is the la the last sort of bits of this, the last bit of my rant, but. I think this is really interesting. So let's look at the prices of drugs in the Western Cape. So this is data from 2010 and 2014. So it's quite recent. So if you were a cocaine wholesaler in 2005, you were buying cocaine at about 200 rand per gram. Okay. The price now in Cape Town of wholesale cocaine is about 275 rand a gram. Okay. But actually, if you sort of adjusted that for inflation, it should be costing you 351 rand a gram. So actually, re realistically, there's been a 21.7% reduction in the price of cocaine. It's even worse for methamphetamine. So methamphetamine now is even is cheaper now than it was back then before adjusting for inflation. So actually after adjusting for inflation, it's 44% cheaper today than what it was 10 years ago. And when you look at heroin, isn't that amazing? Heroin has dropped in price by 50%. Now, I'm not an economist, but I think that says a lot about sort of supply and demand and the relationship between supply and demand. And essentially, heroin has reduced in price by 70% over the last 10 years. And there's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, the sort of global production of opium has now reached record proportions. It's a huge cash crop in Afghanistan. There's allegations now that sort of terrorists and what have you are using opium to fund uh, their organizations. And we, there's a, there's a very, very strong trafficking corridor coming down from sort of the Middle East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, going down to Tanzania. And interesting, Tanzania has been decimated by heroin. They've got a very, very severe problem, of very, very pure, high-quality heroin. Um, and that sort of comes all the way down through Mozambique and mostly into Johannesburg and in KwaZulu Natal on the East Coast. But we're sort of slowly starting to see this heroin migrate over um, into the Western Cape, even to the point now where dealers will give you a free bag of heroin. You know, just to see if you like it. You know, the first one's the first one's always free. So these guys are, in a way, one step ahead of us. They know these trends already. We have to wait four or five years to actually publish something on these trends. But they're sort of on the ground at the coalface, so they know they're one step ahead of us. So anyway, let's look at some commonly used um, sort of, uh, well, common reasons for people seeking treatment, I guess, in South Africa. So this is really a table of all the inpatient um, admissions for the second half of 2014. And it's sort of divided into provinces, and there's a lot of numbers on the, on, on the table. But I think the, the, what I wanted to show you on the table was that still, the most common reason for people seeking inpatient treatment for substances in South Africa is for alcohol. Um, it's particularly high, I think, in KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape. We're seeing high rates of cannabis use as well, but we know that. A lot of people in South Africa smoke cannabis, a lot of people in South Africa drink alcohol. Um, but here, what's interesting is that we're seeing this spike here in heroin use in the Western Cape, 
um, in the Gauteng province and in the northern regions, actually, which is in Pumalanga and Limpopo. Um, this data doesn't yet capture the sort of rise of heroin in KwaZulu Natal, but I think that the, that the more recent data probably will. And what you can see here is a sort of big burden of methamphetamine faced in the Western Cape. So over 35%, 35% of our admissions to treatment facilities are because of methamphetamine-related problems. Um, and what we see normally is that the Eastern Cape normally tends to follow the Western Cape. You know, we get a drug and then the Eastern Cape gets it eventually a little bit later. And we're seeing more and more and more methamphetamine in the Eastern Cape. So I've got a friend who's a farmer in Cathcart. It's a really, really small part of Eastern Cape near Queenstown. And he phoned me and he told me, you know, um, that people have been using methamphetamine in this sort of village, in this area where he was living. And I said, don't be preposterous, man. There's no methamphetamine in the Western Cape. It's, it's cannabis, you know. And then he showed me, first of all, what's, uh, what the community police forum had confiscated, and it sure as hell looked like methamphetamine. And then this data came out, and I guess that, that he was right, you know. So we're not really doing much to stem the flow of drugs across our borders um, from province to province as well as internationally. So it's a little bit disappointing, a little bit sad, and unfortunately what this doesn't capture, so it only captures the inpatient admissions, it doesn't capture the outpatients. And we, I don't even know, I can't tell you how many drug users we've got in South Africa. I can't tell you how many methamphetamine users we have in the Western Cape. I can give you an estimate or a thumb suck, but we unfortunately don't have that data. So it's quite hard to plan uh, clinical services when you don't necessarily have all the correct data, but nevertheless. So let's have a look at substance use disorders in clinical practice. So, so what do I do when I'm assessing patients with substance use disorders, or what do I do in my day job? And basically, a lot of my sort of day job is figuring out where do people fall into this category, you know. So we've got this idea of unhealthy alcohol or other drug use. And look, I think any alcohol or drug use is unhealthy because it has the potential risk for harm. So we need to sort of try and differentiate from, uh, from people, you know. Is it risky use? You know, are they putting themselves at unnecessary harm or potential damage um, by using the substance? Or do they have a really, really severe substance use problem that requires treatment? Or, in fact, most people are somewhere in that big gray area in between. You don't really know um, where are they, where do they fit. So, you know, Sam mentioned this DSM-5 and this Bible that we have, you know, and I guess it's, it's, it's a pretty controversial book, the DSM-5, you know. Don't want to offend anyone, but I think similarly so with the Bible, I think it was written by a lot of faceless people and has been sort of edited and adjusted along the ways without any sort of very clear record of what's actually been, been, been going on. But anyway, we have to use it. It's the way we diagnose people. It's the way we code people. So they've got the sort of substance use disorders as a blanket category, and each particular substance has got its own criteria, but they're generally very similar to this. And basically what you can see from looking at these is basically Basically, a substance use disorder, I think, is when a person's use of a substance has become so um, severe for them that they are not able to do anything else other than use that substance, obtain that substance, or recover from the effects of that substance. In most cases, that will cause dysfunction interpersonally, employment-wise, and um, it can result in sort of legal implications as well. And then this idea of withdrawal and tolerance is very common as well. So withdrawal is basically, or maybe start with tolerance. So tolerance is the need to take more of a drug in order to get the desired effect. And withdrawal is basically the presence of symptoms that emerge when that drug is no longer there. So um, heroin is an excellent example, I guess, of a drug that's got a very, very well-defined withdrawal syndrome. So we do this. I interview the person. We tick the boxes. And then at the end, we add up how many symptoms this person has. And like I said, this is very arbitrary. You know, It doesn't always translate into sort of realness and clinical practice. But anyway, we want to decide, is this mild, moderate, or severe? And the importance for that is it can sometimes help you um, decide on what education or, or what intervention to give for people. So for someone who's not using any drugs or someone who's got a sort of fairly unproblematic drug use, very, very rare, very infrequent, um, hasn't, hasn't caused any problems, then we would give sort of preventative education. I think knowledge is power and giving people all the information so that make, they can make an informed choice for themselves. I think is the most important thing. There's nothing more frustrating than hearing a clinician say to a client, don't use drugs or don't use alcohol. Because it's saying that, you, first of all, you're not, you're, not, you're not making any effort or attempt to understand why that person is using drugs or alcohol. Second of all, to stop using drugs or alcohol might not be realistic for that person at that point in time. And it creates this sort of artificial, sort of patriarchal sort of interaction, like I am the boss and I must tell you and you must do what I say. So 
I'm very much for giving people all the information that they need, a balanced set of information, risks and benefits, um, and allow people to make their own decision. For people with a mild substance use disorder, we would recommend a brief intervention. So a brief intervention can be anything from 10 to 15 minutes with a clinician. It can be looking at some of the potential harms that substances may have caused for that person, a little bit of a thought analysis, a thought exercise, and can often sort of be the first point of contact for referring out to an NGO, for example, for outpatient treatment. But that's more common, I guess, when people have got a moderate substance use disorder. And in severe substance use disorders, most of these patients are unfortunately not able to manage in an outpatient setting. Because as an outpatient, you go into the to treatment and you come out on the same day, quite often into the exact same environment where you came from. So it can be sometimes very, very difficult to sort of implement what you learn in, in, in the sessions into real life. So for people with a severe substance use disorder, we, we recommend either intensive outpatient treatment, so frequent, frequent contact, or in most cases, inpatient treatment. Um, and that can include things like detoxification, withdrawal, um, and some medication like opioid substitution treatment. And the last point there, I guess, aftercare, um, is one area where I think we have really let our patients down, um, and that we don't have a particularly good aftercare system in South Africa. And um, I think that has some important implications when looking at relapse rates, and, I, and I've got a little slide on that as well. So what are the goals of treatment? It really depends, okay? So there's a sort of cycle of change, the stages of change model, which is, which is just a model. Um, and it basically demonstrates how some patients will progress through sort of thinking about their substance use. So quite often patients will enter the cycle in the pre-contemplative phase, where they're not really thinking that substance use is a problem for them. They're not really concerned about it, um, and they're not considering any change. With time, and maybe with some brief interventions, the people can be contemplative. Obviously, by, by definition, this is when people are starting to think about making a change. Determination is when they've decided that they're ready to make a change. And action is when they're implementing things to make a change. You know? And relapse is part of every addiction. It's going to happen more often than not. It's not a failure. It's not a reason to stop treatment. It's just a reason to maybe re-enter here again or at any other point in the cycle. And sometimes patients get through action and then they remain abstinent or they reach their goals, whatever their goals are. And then they're in maintenance. And this is where aftercare and continued support uh, really comes in. And this is where we, 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 I think we do our patients a great disservice. So just to give you sort of some, so, some examples you know, of what patients will say when they're pre-contemplative the person will say, you know, Tuck, it's not a problem for me. Um, or when they're contemplative, they say, you know, you know it's bad for me. I don't, re I don't, I don't really I want to stop, you know, but I'm not really ready to stop right now. Okay. And we hear this all the time. But it's not a case of saying, okay, well, go away, don't come see me again. It's just a case of saying, okay, well, why don't you come see me again in a month and we can chat about it then, again. Then when there's sort of preparation, determination, it's become a real issue now, it's causing big problems for me, I'm thinking of giving it up soon. I'm ready to make a change. And action is things like I deleted my dealer's number, I threw away my pipe, um, I'm not making contact with these friends anymore, I've cut myself off from these people. And then action and maintenance, this is why I say we do our patients a disservice because often in maintenance we hear this, my friends still tick, I'm lonely, I feel left out, I'm bored, I've got nothing else to do, I'm worried that I'm going to relapse. And this is where we really, really need, need to give people sort of the most intensive sort of treatment, I guess, in my opinion. So it's always this idea of sort of balancing short-term needs with long-term goals. And sometimes losing sight of short-term needs means your attempts to get to a long-term goal are going to be derailed from the first moment. So this is where I think it comes into this idea of harm reduction. And harm reduction is, 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 is um, something that's very close to me, I think, because it's a more humane way, I think, and a more ethically palatable way of managing people with substance use disorders. So, for example, someone who's injecting heroin three times a day or four times a day. In Cape Town, people rent out needles, by the way, 10 rand an hour or whatever. So someone who's injecting four times a day and renting out his needle, okay, comes to you and says, I want treatment. And you say, okay, well, what is it that you want? You know, do you want to stop completely? Do you want to do this? Do you want to reduce the amount that you want to take? What do you want to do? And for me, a great success in that situation would be for the patient to say, well, you know what? I'm just going to smoke my heroin from now on. I'm not going to inject it and I'm not going to rent out my needle. So for me, that's a huge victory and that's a huge success because that person is still doing drugs, okay, fine, but they're doing so in a way that's significantly less harmful to them. And I think if you give people that support, maybe in another couple of months' time, that person comes to you and says, you know what, I want to start smoking less. Or you know what, I've tried to stop smoking, but I'm having withdrawal. Is there any medication that you can give me? Or, you know, I'm ready to get into treatment now. Um, and can you help me? Can you help connect me with a professional? 
Okay, so um, as with any injection, I mean, I guess one of the big problems with injecting is that um, HIV and hepatitis are two of the major ones. And there's other risks associated with injecting. So people can get infections in their veins, they can get abscesses, um, they can get an infection in their heart called endocarditis, um, it can cause strokes, it's just, just basically... It's, yeah, it's, it's a quicker high and a more intense high, and what I think we're going to start seeing, we've got a hidden population of injecting drug users in Cape Town, injecting heroin users, but as we start to confiscate more heroin, the users still need to get high, so they then, instead of smoking, which is the sort of preferred mode of administration in Cape Town, actually, patients then rather will inject it because it makes a little bit of heroin go a lot further um, when you're injecting, so there's in a way an incentive for patients to inject, so we need to create incentives for people not to to inject. Another example, for example, uh, another example is with methamphetamine. So everyone, well, there's this condition with methamphetamine called meth mouth, where because methamphetamine dries out your mouth, it dries out your teeth sockets, it causes dental caries, and the teeth fall out. So another harm reduction approach is to say to someone who's smoking methamphetamine, who's not prepared to quit, to say to him, instead of go away, come back when you want to change, say to him, okay, fine, if you're going to smoke, Drink a glass of water every two hours, okay, so that your mouth stays hydrated, so that your teeth don't fall out. Okay, simple advice such as that, you know, and I think it's certainly in my experience when you treat people as human beings and not as second class citizens, they're first of all more likely to come back. You're more likely to build up a good rapport with that person, and then you're more likely to sort of help that person get into treatment when they are ready. Um, I, work, I do a locum as well at this Health for Men clinic in Woodstock, and it serves a population of men who have sex with men, which is a very sort of high-risk population in Cape Town. There's a lot of substance use. And quite recently, uh, until the funding dried up, they had these harm reduction packs. So in a harm reduction pack would be a clean syringe, an alcohol swab to clean the sites of injection, a tourniquet so that people are not using rope and string and who knows what else, a tourniquet that can be released. It would include condoms. It would include a telephone number for the hospital. It would basically include everything that you need in order to be as safe as possible doing something that is very, very unsafe and very, very risky. So that's sort of where, 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 where sort of my sort of passion lies, I guess. And I think to a large extent, this is the way the rest of the world is moving as well. Um, for like Netherlands is a perfect example where they have got shooting galleries where you can go into a room, inject your heroin under supervision of a nurse with a doctor on call, with all the medical equipment available necessary if you were to have an overdose so that we can resuscitate you and save your life. And in the next room, there's a counselor as well. And there's a treatment center basically next door too. So it's a one-stop shop basically for people to come. And certainly, as I said, with repeated brief interventions, just chipping away at the cold face, you never know when you're gonna break through. And you don't know what's happening in that person's life outside of the session. And it may be something that happened in that person's life together with what's happening in the session that actually is that impetus for change that lights that fire under the person. So, I always sort of try and have a realistic approach to managing substances in terms of short-term needs versus long-term goals. So abstinence for a lot of people is a long-term goal. But to try for abstinence as a short-term goal can sometimes be very, very, very difficult and very challenging. But the, the, the Dutch model is, goes further than that. Mm. It's, 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 uh, Amsterdam, 20 years ago, used to be at the drug capital of yeah. the world. Today there is no merchants on the Yeah, yeah. It's a market solution to the, to the drug problem. Yeah. They've taken, they, the Dutch government has taken the, has taken the market away. Yeah. Use yeah. market mechanisms to. Yeah, precisely. That's exactly you right. No. No, 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 yeah, exactly. And it's the same as in Portugal. You know? So very, very similar. Like Lisbon was sort of, I think, so called you don't Needle Park. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The drug addicts are in halfway houses, they're in treatments, they're in, supported, they're in supported housing, for example. So the problem is that the Netherlands, for me, is like an ultra-first world country. They're sort of a level above the first world. I love the place. I, I, I love Netherlands, Rotterdam, and, and, and that place. But it's, it's, I think we've got so far to go in South Africa. And we can't, we can't even convince the government that opioid substitution or needle exchange, um, even, needle exchange is even simpler, we can't even convince the government that taking an addict's dirty needle and giving them a clean needle is a good way to manage injecting drug use. So we're running this project up in Belleville. Um, and there was a park there where 
people have been injecting drugs for 10, 15 years, and the sort of NGO got a little mobile clinic together, and they got some syringes, and they went to the, to the park, and they were exchanging the needles. And they got in big trouble with the police and the ward councillors because they, they were alleged to be um, drawing drug users to the area, but actually the people, the drug users have been in the park for the last 15 years, so it's a moot point, you know, and it's this idea of not in my backyard, you know, so yeah, sure, you can have a needle exchange program, but not in my backyard. You know, sure, you can have a rehabilitation centre for addicts, but not in my backyard. So it's really, really tough to convince politicians um, who are pretty clueless as it comes, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much as clueless as it comes when it comes to substance use disorders. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I mean, I live in London and I'm a, a, a volunteer councillor. Needle exchange worked extremely well. Yes, yeah. Ten needles, yeah. ten swabs, yeah. and a safety box. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's made a huge difference yeah. in terms of infection yes. arising from multiple use of a product yeah. that is, has been designed for single use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm appalled that there are yep. people rent out their needles. It is, yeah, and it's not, it's for ten rand, you know, for the price of a small bag of heroin. You know, it's 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 really it's really yeah, depressing. We've done it in the UK. It's supported by the local council. So yeah. all you have to do when you pick up your, your little pack yeah. is to give your postal code because that means your council will then Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's worked very. I mean, there's such a huge body of empirical literature, empirical evidence looking at the benefits of needle exchange programs and harm reduction. Um, so much to the point where there's no counter argument. There's no arguments against it. I'm sorry, it just doesn't exist. But yeah, to try and convince politicians and to, to be honest, to even try and convince other doctors, to be honest, to be quite frank, um, can also sometimes be as challenging and as frustrating as dealing with politicians too. Yeah. By regulating the supply of drugs, mm. you ensure the quality. Yeah. One of the great problems I think with tick here is there's so much impurity. Yeah. And yeah. the user can tell straight away, usually yeah. within the next couple of hours, whether yeah. they impurities or not. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. And my experience certainly is as more and more people get involved in it, there are more and more impurities. Yeah. And they yeah, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, I mean, in the UK, they've got a huge problem with these sort of research chemicals. So basically, what happens is, say, like, take a drug like cannabis or THC. So THC is illegal. But what happens is someone in a clandestine laboratory will take that THC molecule, will fiddle around with it a little bit, put on a methyl group, take one methyl group off, creates a sort of totally different molecule called THC XYZ 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 that hasn't yet been regulated. And it hasn't been made illegal. So then this drug comes onto the market. You can buy it wherever you want because unregulated, it's legal. And then those drugs cause overdose deaths and serious, serious psychiatric emergencies. And actually, to be honest, don't have the safety profile of some of the other drugs. So, so cannabis, from a physical point of view, is not a particularly dangerous drug. But some of these synthetic cannabinoids, these artificial cannabinoids that people produce, are very, 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 very damaging. So in America, a couple of years ago, there was that sort of guy that the zombie murder. Where, where someone was found eating someone else's face, basically. And that person was intoxicated on a synthetic cannabinoid called K2 or spice. Um, so once again, exactly what you're saying, you know, regulation ensures quality. And that means that as a doctor, I'm confident, I would be confident in prescribing a particular dose, knowing that that is the dose that that person is going to get. But anyway, so if we have a look at some of the outcomes of addiction treatment, it's a little bit disappointing. Um, 40 to 60 percent of patients will relapse within the first 12 months after coming out of treatment. But at the same time, that can be normative. Because if you look at other chronic conditions, like diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, athlete's foot, 40 to 60% of patients will have a relapse or a recurrence of symptoms within their first 12 months after an admission. So these sort of outcomes of addiction, whilst disappointing, are pretty much as disappointing as the outcomes for many, many other chronic physical conditions as well. I'm oh, sorry? Um, yeah. Look, um, so with 12 steps, look, I, I'm not a particularly religious person. Um, they are quite spiritually based, or you can get non spiritual um, groups as well. AA has got advantages and disadvantages. I think one of the big advantages that people call a disadvantage is, in fact, that it's peer led. So there's no professional there guiding the group. Um, People will say that's a bad thing because apparently clinicians always know better. 
But I think that's a good thing because it allows patients a safe space to engage with people that have had similar problems to themselves, that may come from similar backgrounds to themselves, without this idea of someone watching us and taking notes. At the same time, um, I sometimes have a problem with patients going to AA because some AA groups will tell my patients to stop taking their medication. So if we've got the patient on methadone, you know. Um, sometimes the AA groups will, will discourage the use of methadone, which I don't, I don't really like. So I prefer to tell patients rather just tell them you're not on anything and just try and synthesize both, you know. Um, and at the same time, AA hasn't really been subjected to very many high quality, rigorous, randomized trials. Although these sort of types of interventions are always difficult to test in a randomized fashion. But I think the bottom line is that in South Africa, where we have a real dearth of aftercare and support services, using anything and everything that is available um, is more important than not using something. So I, in fact, recommend AA to pretty much all of my patients, or NA to all of my patients. And there's AA and NA, there's Alanon and Noranon and Alatine and Noratine, and we'll speak a little bit more tomorrow about how, what to do if someone you know or you have got a substance use problem. How can you access treatment? What can you do? So it's reassuring that most users with time will curtail and actually stop their use of substances, and we see that from epidemiological studies. Yep. Um, your Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I want to ask you, you don't mention food, mm. sugar. Yeah. And it falls <laughs> into the same category, and I, I well, mm. for me, and I also the yeah. generational aspect of addiction. Mm, mm. So, yeah, certainly. So sort of this, this sort of sociocultural model of addiction where in certain cultures, you know, sort of substance use is permitted or acceptable or allowed, for example. And we see that in South Africa where, where you have three generations smoking drugs together, the grandfather, the father and the son all sharing one pipe. And it can be a very, very sad story to hear. Um, going back to, 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 to food and sugar, <laughs> there's a lot of debate, I guess, in the literature around this. Um, sugar, to my knowledge, doesn't activate the brain in the same way that illicit substances do. So the sort of activation of the reward pathway, the sort of mesolimbic reward pathway of dopaminergic neurons. So those dopamine neurons which fire in response to drugs that give you that burst of pleasure have got receptors for lots and lots of um, different illicit substances, but they don't necessarily have any receptors for sugar molecule itself or for glucose. It's not, not a, it, doesn't, it doesn't really bind in that way. So I'm not sure whether you could consider sugar addiction to be the same as a substance because um, this sort of idea of tolerance and withdrawal and overuse and excessive use, I don't know. I think sugar is quite an easy thing to self-limit. Um, and I'm not aware of any patients having any, any severe, significant withdrawal symptoms. No, I'll tell you why, okay, because I'll tell you, because I used to drink two liters of Coca-Cola a day, right? I was, a, I drank two liters of, of Coca-Cola a day for about 20 years, like from when I was a kid, okay? And that's an excessive amount of sugar. And after a little bit of a sort of health scare or checkup and whatever, I decided, well, I'm going to stop. So I'm going to change to sort of water and sort of non-sugar containing beverages. And I went from two liters of coke a day to basically no liters of coke a day. And it was fine. It was, it was easy. Your mileage may vary. You know, there's a lot of individual variation between me and you and us and them. Um, but I've yet to come across any sort of like, good literature, I guess, that has been able to convince me at least. Although I'm very open-minded and I'll keep an eye on the literature and we'll see if anything comes up. Have you seen the thought sugar? I, I, I haven't. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll take a note. Okay, sugar. Okay, cool. I, mean, I can learn something as well, I think. So it's all about sort of learning from one another. Yeah? I just wanted to ask, when you've done, will you touch on the drug wars mm. in the townships and how regulating the drugs would impact okay. on the violence? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Okay, okay. So let's look um, quite quickly. So we've got about 15 minutes, and we'll just sort of quickly skim through some some of the the, 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 the classes of drugs. Um, so stimulants, I guess, by definition, are activating drugs. Um, we've got naturally occurring ones. So cocaine is alkaloid and cocoa, ephedra, um, and cart, which is a naturally occurring uh, ke chemical. Well, it is cart. It's it's a plant. It grows in central uh, Central Africa. Um, we've got our synthetic stimulants: amphetamines, methamphetamines, and methylphenidate, which is ritalin. So ritalin 
Lupin, methylphenidates. Uh, so methylphenidates, amphetamines, and cocaine are like very much like cousins. They've got a very, very similar pharmacological action, and they've got sort of equally sort of high risks of potential abuse. Um, and nicotine and caffeine, I guess, are two very common stimulants that people use. And when one looks at sort of the history of, of, of amphetamines, you know, the Chinese have been using amphetamine containing plants for, once again, you know, about 5,000 years. Um, the South Americans were known to cultivate cocoa and chew cocoa uh, for, for, because it contains cocaine. If you go to Bolivia today, you'll still see people walking around with sort of their cheeks bulging with, with cocoa leaves. It's very much a sort of socially condoned, socially acceptable um, way of administering this drug. Um, and then in, 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 in the war, in World War I, um, there, was, there was a huge problem with methamphetamine, and also in World War II. So, so I mean, you can see from this advert advertisement, it's encouraging pilots to take amphetamines. Um, it's probably a good, idea, well, a good idea to an extent, because it does make you very alert. It does make you very focused. It would probably make you a better soldier. But at the end of the war, there was this huge stockpile of amphetamines in, China, in, in, in Japan um, and in Sweden, which led to massive, massive uh, rates of abuse and sort of actually led to a lot of the international conventions on drug use. Uh, so when we look at methamphetamine, it can be used intranasally, it can be smoked, or it can also be used intravenously. Um, it's most commonly smoked um, in the Western Cape, and it causes sort of quite a lot of on. It it makes you on. Okay, so increase energy, increase libido, reduce need for sleep, talking a mile a minute, increased heart rate and blood pressure. And sort of for me, um, sudden changes in mood, irritability, and aggression. And these are the acute effects. And what we find is that people who consistently use methamphetamine for long periods of time, like a couple of years, tend to have quite a lot of long-term effects. And these long-term effects are mostly mental. So psychosis, so sort of loss of contact with reality, a sort of nervous breakdown in a way, very similar to um, schizophrenia, almost unmistakable, uh, sort of can't separate them in a way. It's sometimes be very difficult. Also, with coming off of the drug, one can get very, very depressed. Um, there's high rates of suicide and anxiety in the post-withdrawal period. And there's cognitive effects as well. So Samantha yesterday showed you the brain of a methamphetamine user. It takes like 14 months for it to almost get back to normal. And that's because this drug is neurotoxic. It damages your neurons. It basically gives you brain damage. So a really, really, really horrible, horrible, nasty drug. And the Western Cape, not only we are we an important global consumer of methamphetamine, we're an important global producer of methamphetamine as well. And without getting too much into sort of criminology, because it's not really my field of expertise, but certainly if you look at things like abalone poaching, to a lesser extent rhino horn, rhino horn, port, rhino horn poaching, a lot of these um, sort of products find their way back to Asia. And the people that are exporting the products are not paid in cash, but they're paid in chemical precursors, so ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, and chemical precursors to actually make drugs. So it's through the export of our illicit products that we import illicit products and create more illicit products. And we send a lot of stuff west and north up through Africa. Tell me, why is the combination of tuck and heroin, what I call unga, so prevalent in the western Yeah. Yeah, because um, amphetamine, methamphetamine lasts a really long time. It can last up to 24, 48, 36 hours. Um, very long time. But sometimes people need to come down. And the best way to come down after you've taken a stimulant is to take a central nervous system depressant. So in a way, it promotes sleep um, in these patients. And they basically use both at the same time to sort of try and regulate their sleep-wake cycles. And that's quite commonly what we see. Um, Unger itself really is the most consistent chemical that we've isolated from Unger is heroin. And uh, with lots of other different things in it, sometimes this, sometimes that, sometimes this, I think really what Unger is is just a very clever rebranding of heroin by the dealers in Cape Town. Heroin's got these sort of negative connotations to it, but here's a new drug that's called Unger, Wunga, Pinch, Nyope, Sugars. Wherever you are in the country, it's a different name. Um, but what's consistently there is, is heroin. And I think people use it together with methamphetamine, like I said, to, to come down, you know. Um, all right, and then, I mean, let's look at, 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 at stimulants and caffeine. So um, this is the most widely used mood-altering mood drug in the world. And some people in my faculty have got some really serious problems with <laughs> caffeine, I must say. I'm not much of a caffeine drinker myself. I'll probably get it from Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, and stuff. But uh, caffeine was first isolated from coffee and tea in the 1800s. 
Um, we've got an interesting history as well. You know, the sort of Boston Tea Party was a focal point for the U.S. Revolution when um, the Americans, in revolt against British taxes on tea, dumped all of it into the ocean and said, "We'll sod you. We're not paying it." And it became one of the sort of tipping points, I think, for for for, for the for the American Revolution. And caffeine is mostly safe. It's mostly innocuous. It's not sort of a totally innocent drink, though. Um, it can be quite angiogenic. It can cause people to have panic attacks, people to be quite anxious. It is associated with tolerance, and there's definitely a withdrawal syndrome associated with it. But it's not particularly damaging to the body. However, there have been people querying the safety of energy drinks, all right? So, I mean, if you look at it there, there's about 100 milligrams in instant coffee, 70 milligrams of caffeine in an espresso, 30 to 40 milligrams in tea, and in energy drinks, up to 375 milligrams of caffeine. So what, that's, that's five espressos, like a quintuple espresso. So there have been reports of people having cardiac events um, at music festivals and whatever when they're dehydrated and things, or they're taking other medication that can affect their heart because of these energy drinks. And I think they should probably also be regulated, in my opinion. Um, and then when we look at stimulants and nicotine, so people don't know this, but nicotine is a natural insecticide in plants. That's why the tobacco plant produces it, to kill the bugs that eat it. So we actually like to smoke it, maybe because it kills us, I, I don't know. So, so it's essential nervous system stimulants. It increases alertness and wakefulness. Smokers will tell you it makes them feel calm. I think more what it is really is it's a relief of withdrawal symptoms when you feel edgy that people say, oh, the cigarette calms you. What it's actually doing is just relieving your withdrawal symptoms because you're, you're dependent. Um, it's extremely toxic in small doses. You know, a couple milligrams of nicotine, a gram of nicotine will, 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 will kill you. Ten milligrams of nicotine will kill you if you take it in one dose. It will definitely kill a child. Um, and never mind nicotine being toxic, the delivery mechanism of tobacco is like even more toxic than, than the flipping drug itself. So tobacco is a Associated with over 300 health-related conditions, that results in sort of expenditure, health expenditure savings, uh, health expenditure in the United States. I don't know if that really came out very clear, but 500 billion dollars per year is, sp is spent. Sorry, this is actually globally. 500 billion dollars globally on the direct medical-related costs of tobacco. So that's like almost double our GDP. So it's quite sobering. Um, and what's interesting is that, um, we'll skip over the first bit, the, the World Health Organization estimates that about one third of the adult population smokes. In the developed world, people are smoking less. In low to middle income countries and in developing countries like South Africa, rates of smoking are in the increase. And we're seeing rates of smoking on the increase amongst the people that are most disadvantaged and the people that have come from really, really poor socioeconomic backgrounds. And especially common among psychiatric patients. 70 to 80 percent of patients with schizophrenia smoke tobacco. Patients with serious mental illness die 10 to 15 years earlier than you or me because of smoking, very often smoking related complications. And the tobacco industry, the very powerful industry with a lot of lobbying power, has fooled the mental health community into believing these garbage lies that um, psychiatric patients smoke to structure their day. They smoke to relieve side effects. They smoke to, to be social with other people. They smoke to give themselves pleasure. They smoke to do X, Y, and Z, everything except the fact that they smoke because they're addicted. Okay? And 50% of cigarette sales in the United States goes to people with a serious mental illness. And the tobacco industry has got a very serious invested interest in continuing to peddle their poison to this very, very vulnerable population. And there's this therapeutic nihilism about smoking and, and schizophrenia. People will say, well, why bother? They're just going to keep smoking. But that's not an excuse to not try. I just, you know. Hmm? It's, there's a lot, lot, lot less smoking in the United States now than yeah. there was when I was growing up. In, in the 80s, everybody smoked. And yeah. um, I have a group of 30 or 40 friends that I have. There's literally three people. That yeah, smoke. yeah, I yeah. Mean, when I came here, I was blown away that it's, it's yeah. exponentially more. Yeah. Right? And it's so expensive. Yeah. Cigarettes are like 10 bucks a pack, right? But yeah. Pack, so yeah. In, at Falkenberg Hospital, the psychiatric hospital just, just over the Black River, um, we've got a, a tobacco budget. So perverse, I hate it. We've got a 300,000 rand tobacco budget per year to buy the patient's tobacco. We don't buy them like decent quality tobacco. We buy them the cheapest, crappest BB tobacco that you could ever see. And there's no budget for rolling paper, so the patient's got to smoke telephone paper. I just, it, I swear to you, it, it is, it is, it's preposterous and like, it, it incensed me, which is why I was, you know, trying to sort of make a change where, where I can, you know, but... Don't they use the, the uh, cigarettes for, as reinforcements? Well, well, you mean the, the, the staff giving it to the patients? Yeah, it's, it, in a way it's used as like a perverse incentive, you know, if you take your medication, you have your breakfast, you have smoke time. 
but tjoh, that's not a that's not a good way to positively reinforce something with someone because it's like only you kind of consign them to an early grave but you're right it is used as a bargaining tool as currency as everything and, yeah, okay. Um, so as I've mentioned here on the slide, and Sam mentioned yesterday, you know, this sort of conditioned cues, you know, this sort of intensity and frequency of conditioned cues in tobacco is unique to nicotine because let's say someone who starts smoking by the time they're 16. By the time they're 21, that person has been exposed to tens of thousands of smoking-related cues, far more than if they were using an illicit, illicit substance, for example. And it's that sort of reinforcing, that sort of dose and duration of the cues that I think make it so difficult for people to actually maintain once they've withdrawn from nicotine. To withdraw from nicotine is easy, but to maintain that withdrawal from nicotine is the tough part. And once again, there's also no coincidence that there's 20 cigarettes in a box. So, Without getting into the pharmacology too much, um, it basically, you've got nicotine receptors. When you smoke, the nicotine goes to your brain, binds to the nicotine receptor, causes dopamine to be released. It takes about five to 10 minutes for that neuron to become desensitized. So it's not producing any dopamine anymore, which is about the amount of time it takes to smoke a cigarette, right? about five minutes. And then it takes 45 minutes, pretty much all the time for every person to, for that receptor to resensitize, for that receptor to be susceptible or um, to be open for more nicotine to bind there. So if you times 20 by 45 minutes, it comes to 16 hours. And most people sleep eight hours a day. So is there a coincidence that there's 20 cigarettes in a box? I don't think so. I think the tobacco industry are very, very smart and they've thought about this very, very, very carefully. Um, the sad thing is that there's a number of pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments. About three quarters of people who want to smoke, three, three, three quarters of people who smoke want to quit. Let, uh, actually less than a third try per year and less than 3% succeed. Okay? So this is something that you've got to keep trying. If you fail the first time, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Figure it out. What didn't go wrong this time and make a change so it doesn't happen again the second time. And keep trying. Okay? If you try 30 times, you're probably going to have a 90% chance of success. But most people quit before that. Most people take about seven or eight times to quit. But it can be done. So, um, like Pavlovian, Pav Pavlov's dogs, basically. So, um, drinking a cup of coffee um, makes me feel like having a cigarette, for example, because that sort of cue of having the coffee has sort of been paired with that stimulus. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let's have a look at the central nervous system depressants. We have to go quite quickly, I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, so alcohol, you know, once again is another economic powerhouse for this massively powerful industry in South Africa. Um, and interestingly, you know, there was this talk about a ban on alcohol advertising a few years ago. I, I don't think it's been gazetted yet or whatever, but I'll tell you, the government has basically reneged on that. They're not going to ban the, the alcohol advertising like every other country in the world. Most countries have banned alcohol advertising and set fixed minimum pricing. Our government has decided not to do that in the interests of um, a collaborative relationship with the alcohol industry and their sponsorship of sporting events and other um, philanthropic gestures uh, means that the government is going to add another 3 to 4 percent sort of sales levy tax um, on alcohol. So the alcohol industry is already kicking back and saying, but we already tax, we already donate money to this, this and that, why are you giving us more money? So nothing's, probably nothing's going to happen about it and you'll still be able to take a group of children that come from a very difficult background with substance abuse and take them to a cricket game or a rugby game and see their sports stars and idols sponsored by an alcohol company. It just, it just doesn't really, it doesn't send the right message, does it? Um, We'll skip over this really um, to sort of what one standard unit of alcohol is, just to know that your body can metabolize about one standard unit of alcohol per hour, less so in the elderly and less so in women. But if you sort of drink it about one unit per hour or maybe one unit every hour and a half, you, 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 you'll be in a good position to, for example, drive if you wanted to, although I wouldn't recommend it. You wouldn't be over the limit. You know, your body will process and metabolize and pass through that alcohol. But alcohol is not our friend. Alcohol is the third leading preventable cause of death in the world. Now, with total costs actually exceed that of tobacco. It's um, toxic to almost all your tissues. We know the Western Cape and fetal alcohol syndrome. It's sort of, we have got the highest rates of fetal alcohol syndrome in the world in South Africa. It's not something we really like to boast about, but we don't really have much to boast about right now. So unfortunately, we have to boast about that. And it's a really, really sad, really, really, really sad situation. Eh? And then all these other things that I mentioned earlier, road traffic fatalities, domestic violence, overdose deaths from alcohol poisoning, and withdrawal deaths from alcohol withdrawal are increasingly common 
um, and really, really poorly managed, uh, in, in my experience, by physicians and my colleagues. So we have a look at opiates and opioids. So opiates is really anything that's naturally occurring. So the, pup, the poppy, the opium poppy, Papavia somniferum. Um, if you cut the seed pod, a sap comes out. That sap is essentially raw opium. It contains three alkaloids, morphine, codeine, and thebane. And you some morphine and codeine are too commonly used pharmaceutical drugs. Um, and thebane is less psychoactive. And then what happened is, is you can then sort of modify those drugs and molecules to then come up with synthetic or semi-synthetic opioids. But basically what these drugs have in common is that they act on the opiate receptor in the brain. They have very, very sort of um, good analgesics. They relieve pain extremely well, but at the same time are very narcotic and are very habit-forming. So we've touched a little bit on sort of the natural and the synthetic drugs. I just mentioned there heroin, unga, wunga, pin, sugars, now up here, as I said earlier. It's all the same thing, it's just, just heroin. And heroin's an interesting drug, so it's synthetic, I guess, but it's a precursor drug. So it actually gets broken down into morphine and another sort of active variant of morphine as well. So it's like a double opioid in a way. And when we look at heroin, I mean, there was a, it was marketed in the 1870s by Bayer, I think, <coughs> and for pain relief and as a cough suppressant. Um, but at the same time as developing heroin, we developed the hypodermic needle. So people started to figure out quite quickly um, that the two could go quite well together. And um, it, it obviously causes a, a significant problem. And um, it led to the drug being sort of, sort of criminalized and classified quite early on. Um, and then obviously now most of it is in its non-medical use, you know, where um, people use it for this euphoric inducing effects initially, but very, very quickly people sort of use it to relieve a very, very unpleasant withdrawal syndrome. Um, so these are some of the effects of heroin. I think the, 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 the important thing you have to take home of this is that it can affect any part of your body um, and any organ. This slide didn't come out really that clearly, unfortunately, but this is sort of looking specifically at injecting drug use. So eyes, nose, lungs, heart, stomach, blood vessels, reproductive system, intestines, kidneys, liver, skin, and brain can all potentially be affected by heroin. It's highly habit-forming after using for about four weeks. This idea of using heroin once and becoming addicted forever is not true, it doesn't happen. Um, but the more frequently one uses, the more likely one is to become dependent. I mean, it can cause things, like I said, abscesses, blood-borne infections, and so on and so on. Then benzodiazepines, you know, sort of my bugbear, I hate these things because uh, they're probably one of the most difficult drugs to actually get people off. So diazepam, valium, lorazepam, ativan, pax, whatever they're called, you know. Um, the Rolling Stone song, Mother's Little Helper, was sort of more about barbiturates um, than benzodiazepines, but the benzodiazepines came along to replace barbiturates um, because barbiturates were found to be very unsafe and very harmful in pregnancy. So the problem with these drugs is that they're prescription drugs, so people have this idea that they're safe. You know, that, 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 that I can take these because my doctor's prescribing it. But what the doctor doesn't tell them, that these drugs are actually very, very, very habit forming. And one of them, as I said, one of the most difficult drugs to get people off. And we tend to do that in hospital because people can have seizures and they can get into a delirium and they can become very, very ill when with, with withdrawing these drugs very quickly. The problem is that the, the, the sort of dependency is very innocuous and subtle. You only realize that you're dependent when it's time to stop. And for a long time, we've been saying, oh, these drugs are probably not that harmful, you know, aside from the dependence, you know, I'm not going to cause any other problems. But we're starting to see that in the elderly, they're associated with, with fractures, with, 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 with hip fractures and falls. Um, and there's also a tentative association between Alzheimer's disease and the use of these drugs as well. Yeah, sorry, it's just okay. Uh, sorry. okay. Yeah, the, the, it's a tentative association. We're not really sure yet, um, but... Uh, these benzodiazepines, so Valium is probably the quintessential one. There's so many of these, like an anti-anxiety pill. So if a doctor prescribes you something to take the edge off, which they commonly do, it's probably one of these drugs. And I think, ask your doctor, what does the literature say about the dependence? I'm worried about becoming dependent on these drugs. And they're commonly sold as sleeping tablets as well. That's another thing, you, you, the GP will say, we well, have some sleeping tablets, and there'll be Zopiclone or Zolpidem, Stilnox, or whatever. So you must ask your doctor, I think, are these drugs addictive? And if so, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. So knowledge is power, as I keep saying. And then just to quickly end um, on, 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 on cannabis, we've got three minutes over time, but I'll spend two minutes here. So as I said, you know, cannabis, 
it's probably one of the oldest known drugs that we've had. Um, the Chinese were using it not only for medicinal reasons, but also for hemp, um, cultivating hemp. Uh, hemp's an amazing product. You can build houses and bricks and rope and sheds and a whole lot of stuff out of it. And there is an NGO in South Africa called Food and Trees for Africa that has just recently got the first commercial license um, to produce hemp in South Africa. So I think it's going to be really good for the country. It's going to create a lot of jobs, I think, and create a good industry. And hopefully it will give us a product that we can export. Um, it's got purported clinical uses. It's important here. You know, this is not like set in stone. This is just really what people say. Okay, so it's an antiemetic. It makes you relieves nausea. It can stimulate appetite. That's definitely true in people with HIV. Um, it can apparently act as an anticonvulsant. It's been used in neurological and movement disorders. Sometimes as an analgesic, and sometimes used to treat glaucoma. The problem is, is that these trials, if there have been any clinical trials, are generally quite small trials. They're mostly uncontrolled trials, so you're not comparing it to anything else, and you really need to compare it to something else or a placebo in order to really say whether it's, whether it's helpful or not. But there is a sort of emerging literature on this. Um, and every time I look and search around it, there's more and more papers coming out. But there are risks for cannabis use. It is habit forming. There's tolerance and withdrawal. It's got pretty much all the properties of a reinforcing drug. Although the implications of having a cannabis use disorder are less clear than comparing it to an opioid use disorder or a cocaine use disorder, for example. And there's this link to mental illness, this complex interplay between genetics, environment, and potency of cannabis. But what I tell the medical students all the time, and this is my gospel, okay, is that cannabis is neither sufficient nor necessary to cause mental health problems, but it's very often contributory. So you can have a mental illness without having ever smoked cannabis, okay? And you can have a mental illness smoking a whole bunch of cannabis. And the opposite can be true as well. It's very difficult for us to predict. So that's why I think understanding uh, and giving people knowledge and being able to sort of assess people and look at family history and genetic studies and things like that might help us to sort of identify who may be more at risk. But most certainly when you look, and there's people say that cannabis is a gateway drug or tobacco is a gateway drug, alcohol is a gateway drug. I think maybe the last thing that that, um, that, that well, the second last thing I'll leave you with today is that um, the biggest gateway drug for me is poverty. And irrespective of any other drug or any other situation or setting that people find themselves in, and whether you call it a poverty, a drug, or whatever, it's a moot. But we're having this war on drugs. What about the war on flippant poverty? You know? So, but anyway. <laughs> So that's just me on my soapbox. So when we look at cannabis use, I think, and this is maybe the last point that, I, that I'll end with, you know, the damage to the developing brain caused by cannabis, and your brain develops until you're about 25 now. You're still cutting off connections, making new connections, doing a whole lot of stuff. The damage that cannabis can cause in that is very much understated. We gloss over that. We neglect to tell people that. We need to be telling people more and more about this, that it's very, 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 very much understated. Please don't underestimate the damage that cannabis can cause to your child's brain, okay? But at the same time, once your brain has fully developed, I think the damage to a developed brain is, is, is very much overstated. And it leads to us in a situation in South Africa where 30 to 40% of the population will, has used cannabis at some point in their life, and that 30 to 40% of people is therefore at risk of having a criminal record and being prosecuted and being viewed as a very, very sort of awful, horrible person, I think is unfair, unnecessary, and really not humane. And this is just a map looking at legality of cannabis by countries. So you can see that there is a shift, there is a momentum um, towards decriminalizing cannabis for medical use and in some places even legalizing. So the, the color for Canada is actually, actually wrong. Um, it should be dark green, um, similar to Alaska because Trudeau has now sort of legalized cannabis. I don't think it's been rubber stamped, but it's been legalized. And what's interesting is that countries with records of pretty poor human rights records, even Russia, I don't know why they put Russia yellow, um, are red. So. While the, while, while the rest of the world is going right, we need to go right too instead of doing wrong. But anyway, the problem with the debates on cannabis and drug decriminalization and drug policy is this. You've got two people shouting at each other with a loudspeaker and no one's hearing anyone. And actually this person in the middle should probably be mediating, but the mediator is just stepping back saying, well, just keep shouting because I can't really be bothered at the end of the day. So knowledge is power. Thank you very much for the time. If anyone's got any questions, please. Thank you.
patient management of fractures of children with burns, for example, it seems to have a rapid, rapid antidepressant action, literally within an hour after receiving a dose that is maintained for up to 72 hours. So this is unheard of in our sort of pharmacological literature. When we give patients antidepressants, we say, well, you're gonna, you need to wait a couple of weeks before these things start working. But here we've actually got a drug that's unfortunately a controlled substance that might be actually the sort of wonder drug for the treatment of depression. That's why it's important to have, to have an idea of this. And I think what's important to emphasize is that alcohol, tobacco, and benzodiazepines um, are, in my opinion, sort of three of the biggest killers when it comes to substances. And these are actually legal substances. Sorry, could you just point out where alcohol is? Oh, it's right up there at the top. Oh, right up there at the top, yeah. A very, very damaging, damaging toxic substance. So the war on drugs, right? So, so Richard Nixon, you know, the first president sort of to, to, to ever resign from office in the United States. Um, in June 1971, he launched this war on drugs, you know, this sort of highly militarized, we're going to destroy drugs by force, we're going to attack the traffickers, we're going to attack the producers, and we're going to attack the users as well because they're morally repugnant and reprehensible and need to be punished. So it was a very, very punitive approach to substance use disorders. Um, and in fact, it was sort of launched in the 1971, there was this this um, UN Convention on Psychotropic Substances, which essentially sort of set out how we classify drugs, so class one, class two, class three, and class four. And if you sort of go and look at that document, what you'll find is that it's actually really, really arbitrary. So they classify drugs depending on risk of harm to self, risk of harm to others, and potential therapeutic value. But when you look at some of the drugs, like for example, class one are drugs that have got no therapeutic value, they're very, very damaging to the self and very, very damaging to others. We're actually seeing drugs there like psilocybin, MDMA, to a lesser extent cannabis um, that may or may not have some sort of therapeutic value. And then in Schedule 2, which is actually supposed to be less severe, we've got very, very harmful, damaging drugs like methamphetamine. So uh, the classification, like I said, is very, very arbitrary. And unfortunately, South Africa signed this convention, as did most countries in the world. So we're kind of actually using 40 or 50 year old legislation at the moment in South Africa to decide on what drugs should and shouldn't be legal and how we manage drugs that are and aren't legal. So the sort of unintended consequences, I guess, of this war on drugs, you know, and I'll sort of just read it here in case people can't see, but prohibition laws cultivate a drug culture of an amplified danger and risk, and this is really, really true. And the tragedies of drug abuse, which are very real, I've seen them, they're real, they exist, but these tragedies are used as evidence. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me clearly? I've practiced. Yesterday, nobody could hear me. Welcome to the second lecture in the course on the brain and behavior aspects of addiction. To this morning we have Dr. Mike West, who is, a, who is serving under a joint appointment with the University of Cape Town in the Department of um, Psychiatry and Mental Health, where he's attached to the addictions division, and the provincial government of the Western Cape. He conducts his clinical duties in the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health out of Grootskia Hospital, where he co-manages the acute psychiatric inpatient service. He also consults in private practice at a Kiso clinic in Milneton. Since completing his postgraduate degree in psychiatry in 2013, Dr. West also completed a year-long fellowship in psychopharmacology under Professor Dan Stein. He will, I'm sure, explain what that is, but we probably all have a sense it's got to do with drugs and mental illness, <laughs> the drugs that is supposed to help in mental illness. Anyway, so he completed a fellowship in psychopharmacology under Professor Dan Stein, who is also the head of the department, okay? And as he's recently published a series of treatment guidelines for the management of common psychiatric conditions. He is highly knowledgeable in the assessment, diagnosis, and management of substance use disorders. And interestingly, he says he is a proponent of harm reduction and evidence-based practices. And I hope you will talk more about that in your lecture because I looked it up and discovered there is a whole international network of people involved in against um, who's, who's in involving the whole problem of drug abuse, who believes in this concept of harm reduction, 
and evidence-based practices. I know a little bit about it, Abhiri, but I think you should talk more about it. He says he's also an outspoken critic of the war on drugs. And he describes himself as an eternal student. So he just recently completed his M4. Use of substances goes back to about 13,000 years before the present time. Uh, there have been reports of, of, of um, people in Timor and Thailand eating betel nut, which is a sort of stimulant containing uh, a sort of a plant product. Um, it's also quite closely linked to um, mouth cancer and oral cancer and what have you and all of that. Before European contact in Australia um, and in North America, the sort of native peoples there were growing tobacco quite frequently. That goes to back to about 7,000 years ago when the people in South America were also growing cocoa uh, for its naturally occurring alkaloid cocaine. We've got a sort of her earliest recorded use of opiates, so uh, morphine and opium, going back to about 2,000 years um, before today. And it comes out of Mesopotamia, I think. We've got about, got about a 3,000 year history of psychedelic use um, with mescaline and the peyote cactus and psilocybin and magic mushrooms. Um, and we've got about a three to 4,000 year history of, cannab of cannabis use as well, going back to China. So the point is, is that most people today in the world, believe it or not, use at least one psychoactive substance. And that could be something like caffeine, it could be, um, it could be tobacco, it could be other illicit substances like prescription medication, or it could be illicit substances like most of what we're going to talk about today. So by psychoactive, what we mean really is that it affects the mind. So there's another word that I'm probably also going to throw around, which is narcotic. And narcotic essentially just means it gets you high. It, it, it gives some sort of positive reinforcing effect. So most people use at least one psychoactive substance in the world, and this is quite controversial, but most people do so without any problems whatsoever. And I've got a graph to show you that a little bit later, and it, 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 it will, I think, help to put things into perspective a little bit. But let's not forget, okay, that substance use disorders are associated with significant and serious physical disease, and obviously in my field of expertise, mental illness, sometimes this idea of temporality, you know, what came first, the addiction or the mental illness, or vice versa, it's very much a chicken or the egg scenario, and they're very, very intimately related in terms of cause and effect. There's obviously a lot of disability, both personal disability, loss of workplace disability, loss of income, loss of productivity, and death, of course. Um, in, 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 in some instances, a substance use disorder can be so severe that it will result in the death of a person, either from intoxication, from overdose, and in sometimes in the cases of alcohol and prescription medication during the withdrawal period, which is actually the most dangerous time for those drugs. So the next slide is a, is, 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 is a really interesting slide. His, master, his master's in addictions mental health, which is a new course which the department has started, about, I think about how many years ago? About two, it's only about two, three years old. And I don't think there's any, anywhere else in the country where you can do a master's in this addiction counseling. For people interested in, you may have your PhD or whatever qualification, whatever other aspect of medicine or psychology. But people come and register for this because it specializes in the treatment of addictions. So it's a very exciting new course that the department has started. And what he's doing also, he is investigating, he's also, we were just chatting about it now, he also is also working on investigating different clinical approaches to help patients with schizophrenia to stop smoking. Okay, uh, hi, morning, morning everyone. Uh, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, just like Sam yesterday, if I'm going too fast or if I start mumbling, please just let me know, okay? Thank you very much for the introduction. It makes me sound a lot more uh, important than what I actually am, but that's, I guess, the point of a good introduction. So uh, thank you very much for everyone attending today. Um, yesterday was a really, really interesting lecture. Um, today we're going to be a little bit less technical, a little bit more clinically orientated. I am a clinician at heart. I am a doctor by training, so that's where my sort of field of interest and where my expertise lie. So so what we'll do, we'll speak a little bit this morning about the social epidemiology of substance use. So really these sort of social constructs um, that lead to substance use. Uh, oh, goodness. Good idea. Let's do that. There we go. Okay.
cool. So we're going to talk about the social epidemiology of substance use a little bit, and I'm going to sort of orientate you guys to, to, to I think, some quite interesting um, data on substance use disorders, which I don't think many people know. Um, we'll have a look at particular substance use disorders in clinical practice. How do we do an assessment? What are the goals of the intervention? And we'll have a look, a little closer look, at some of the sort of bigger classes of drugs that are more commonly used in the Western Cape. So we'll have a look at stimulants, we'll have a look at central nervous system depressants, and cannabis is its own drug, it's in its own category, it doesn't really fit neatly into anywhere. It's a very, very uh, hot topic at the moment, so I think uh, hopefully there'll be some time at the end and we can have a little bit of a chat about cannabis and, and have a look at the evidence for that. So in order to, let's, let's, let's contextualize before we start. So, you know, this historical, I'm not sure if you can really uh, see the stuff very much, but basically this is a analysis that was published in about 2010 <laughs> in the International Journal of Psychopharmacology by Professor David Nutt, um, who's based in the UK. He's a very, very outspoken um, scientist, researcher, and psychiatrist. And he was the drug czar for the UK until maybe about four or five years ago when together him and his team of researchers published a paper comparing the use of MDMA or ecstasy with riding a horse. And what he managed to find and demonstrate very elegantly in the study, in fact, was that MDMA was about 30 to 40 times more safe than riding a horse. You're more likely to have a serious fatal incident playing polo or riding a horse than you are taking ecstasy, which is very, very interesting. But he came out and said that, and then he got fired. because. Uh, <laughs> But he's still very, very active in the research community. He does really, really great lectures, and he's very, very involved now, actually, in, in, in looking at um, the potential use of psilocybin or magic mushrooms in the treating of depression and anxiety. But back to this slide, basically what he did, him and his team of researchers, what they did and what they plotted on the graph was they took all the substances of abuse, the most common substances of abuse, and they plotted them along this graph. So what we've got here on the x-axis is basically a sort of quantifiable score of harm to users. And on the vertical axis, on the y-axis, we've got a score for harm to others. And then drugs were plotted based on their risk of harm to self and harm to others. And what we can see here is that quite clearly, crack cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine are very, very, very damaging and harmful to the user. What we see up here is very interesting, is alcohol. It seems to sort of be in the, a little bit in the middle. Um, but you see that these sort of harms to others are significant. And this is because of things like road traffic accidents, domestic violence, and so on and so on and so on. And then here we've got our, our friend tobacco, cocaine, amphetamines, which sort of fall somewhere in the middle. And what's quite interesting is actually there's a lot of clustering on this graph. And a lot of sort of drugs are clustered around the sort of bottom left corner of the graph, sort of with the implications being that the harm to users and the harm to others may be less than what we've been led to believe or what we we've been told. And this is important um, sort of implications for research because if we want to do research on a particular drug, we need to demonstrate that there's no harms or that the harm to the or that the potential risk of harm to participants in the trial is minimal. So this is actually really, really good so that we can demonstrate this. And actually out of this, there's been a lot of trials looking at ketamine, which is a an anesthetic drug. It's also used as a horse tranquilizer. It's very, very effective medication for the outpatient